It's one minute to midnight, and we need to act now. The Prime Minister's warning on climate change to the biggest gathering of world leaders ever assembled in the United Kingdom. But are they ready to deal with humanity's greatest threat? This is The Great Debate. Getting to the heart of the issue dominating the headlines, tonight on The Great Debate, climate change is bringing pressing new threats to our way of life and security. Around the world, people are already suffering devastating consequences. Some nations warn they even face extinction. Can global leaders meeting in Glasgow find a way to turn the tide and avert disaster? Our viewers panel, drawn from across the country and beyond, will share their views. They'll have their say, and they'll put their questions to our studio guests. Joining us this week, Mary Robinson, former UN Climate Envoy and Human Rights Commissioner, who now leads the global campaign for climate justice. Plus, Richard Walker, the Managing Director of Iceland Foods. Chidi Oti Obahara, co-founder of the COP26 Climate Action Plan and an activist from the Direct Action Campaign Group, Extinction Rebellion. And climate scientist, Dr. Ella Gilbert. Tonight, the big question facing them all about the climate crisis, is it already too late? The world must wake up. Quite literally, it is the last chance saloon. Ultimately, all of us will feel the impact, some of which are now unavoidable. It's one minute to midnight on that doomsday clock. Build back better, blah, blah, blah. We have to get everybody to do more. A green economy, blah, blah, blah. It's gone from being 35 degrees Celsius to now suddenly this absolutely torrential rain. This isn't normal. This is literally about the future of the planet. I think it can be done. Let's get straight to the war. Let's go to our viewers panel. And I am going to start with Tom Rogers in London. Tom, what's your view on this question? Good evening, Trevor. Good evening, panel. Um, my question is, when will the government get serious about climate change? Why have you any doubts about that, Tom? I have a few, Trevor. So if you look at the Chancellor's budget speech last week, I think he talked for 70 minutes and didn't mention climate once. Here in the UK, we have plans to build a new coal mine amongst many other fossil fuel projects. And I don't see how we can hold the likes of China and India to account if we're planning coal mines of our own. I don't think we're doing enough on skills and jobs. So if you look at the government's net zero strategy, it says that we need to fit 600,000 heat pumps a year. There's nothing from the government in terms of how we're going to develop those skills um, and develop people to, to do those heat pumps. And then finally, I think most concerning, I've seen very little from the government on how we protect people on lower incomes. This is going to be expensive for people. They're going to have to change their cars, change the way they heat their homes, make lifestyle changes. So I've got several doubts. OK, I can see some support for that from our viewers panel. But let's first come into the studio. And t panels, Tom's question is, when will the government get serious about climate change? Ella Gilbert, you follow this closely. <laughs> What's your answer? Well, as a climate scientist, we've known for decades and decades that really ambitious action is needed and the scale of the climate problem is huge and we've known that for years and years. And we've had lots and lots of time for successive governments to start to take actions to challenge the, the climate crisis. And yet it's, it seemed to be quite difficult so far. Um, we have lots of kind of rhetoric about governments taking climate change seriously and implementing targets and pledging to make changes. But then, as Tom says, sometimes those their actual actions don't necessarily correlate with what they say they should be. Let me come to you, Mary Robinson. Um, 
You follow this closely. In fact, you're responsible for monitoring a lot of the action here. Um, we're talking about our government here, UK government. What's your rating on the British government? The British government has done well in some ways in its own ambitions, ambitious targets on clean energy and on uh, net zero. But I do agree with the point that was made by your questioner. Uh, a president of the COP has to give exceptional leadership, frankly, because it has to lead the other leaders. And it is true that on you know, commitment on um, Cumbria oil, or sorry, Cumbria coal, or Cambo, the oil field that in, in the North um, Sea. Um, these are not what a presidency should be thinking of. And also, the cuts in in, in, in development aid. Um, you know, and the fact that that's now being extended in the recent um, budget of the Chancellor. Uh, and the fact, as, as as was mentioned, you know, the Chancellor's budget. Uh, hardly mentioned. In fact, it mentioned net zero once. It didn't mean, mention climate at all. Um, we need mm. governments that give a leadership about being in a mindset of crisis, a mindset of crisis. And we didn't feel that, even though the United Kingdom has done quite a lot in a good way as an, as a, you know, an industrialised country. OK, thank you. Richard Walker, um, you're a business person and you have to spend a lot of time worrying about what the government, uh, what the framework that the government sets is. Um, are they doing as well as they ought to? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, what some of the panellists have said, because um, I, I, think they, I think the Chancellor in his budget mentioned the word cider um, uh, more than he did climate. In fact, as Mary said, he didn't mention climate at all. So um, whilst the government is certainly good about talking about climate change, what we now need, as you said, is a, a framework uh, for the market to operate in. Now, I'm a capitalist um, and generally in favour of, of less regulation. But of course, when we have something as urgent and as existential as climate change, what we need is more government intervention, more of a framework for the market to operate in. Because quite frankly, we don't have time for the good companies to rise to the top and for the bad companies uh, to be eliminated. Um, and therefore, what the government really needs to face into now is thorny issues that are tough uh, to get past voters, uh, but things like uh, a carbon tax or a consumption tax, uh, trying to get people, uh, wean people off uh, things like meat. All of these are very uh, tricky issues. Um, that are going to be full of ambiguity and nuance and uh, quite frankly difficult but you know if we're really serious and if we really are one minute to midnight that's what we're going to have to um, start facing into and I suppose ultimately what we need is a framework for business where businesses compete on how environmentally beneficial they are and mm -hmm. we tax things we don't want like plastics and deforestation and pollution yep. and we don't tax things that we do want like jobs. Okay. Chiti, um Otio Bahara, I have a horrible feeling that we're going to have uh, the unusual situation where a supporter of Extinction Rebellion is going to support a self-declared capitalist on this. Well, thank you for the introduction, Trevor. And before my time in Extinction Rebellion, I actually worked as an investment banker in the City of London. So I think it's really important to dispel this idea that Extinction Rebellion have an ideological bent. We don't. We are focused on the climate emergency. And within the context of answering Tom's question, this government is having a challenging time trying to clearly show an action plan that gets us from point A to point B. And crucially, for example, the government came out last year with a 10-point plan, including, and this is a key action point in that plan, a homes grant, a green homes grant, which was supposed to help insulate people's homes and supposed to help them get a grant so that there could be a just transition away from where we currently are and away from fuel poverty. But well, what happened, of course, was that that fell apart completely. Um, the Green Homes Grant was supposed to be available until this month. It was cancelled in April. And we know just for the fact that COVID has inter interceded, we know for the fact that the government is frequently distracted and does not prioritise climate change, we know that the results that come out of this is a feeling from the public that they're being left behind, they're not being listened to, that their democratic rights aren't being supported. We see demonstration after demonstration okay. that isn't just Extinction Rebellion, it's hordes of young people. But we're not seeing legislative follow-up. We're not seeing acts that put okay. this into place. All right. Um, 
we don't have anybody from the government here, but I suspect if they were, they would say that so, well, at Paris there were only 30 percent of countries that had set targets. Now there are 80 percent. They would say that the UK was the first country to uh, set a net zero target of 2050 uh, and that actually use of coal, for example, has been cut from 25 percent of our energy needs to, I think, I think it's now 2 or 3 percent. Uh, not for me to make the government's case, but uh, we try to be as fair as we can on this programme. So let me come to the wall. Let's see the viewers' panel. Uh, those who think the government could do better? Yeah. That is pretty much everybody. OK, let me go to... Um, I see Jan Adamson in Carmarthen in Wales. Jan, you, you think the government ought to be able to do better. T tell us why. Yes, I do. I think that many people really want to do something constructive to stop this climate crisis. One of the best schemes was the feed-in tariff for solar panels. Uh, that's a way for individual households to be contributing sustainable energy to the national grid. And instead, in 2019, the government pulled the plug on it so that no feed-in tariff scheme operates with that. Now, instead, we have the heat pump initiative. And from my own research, because I was thinking about doing that myself, um, it doesn't work well in older houses. It doesn't work so well in the winter. It's expensive to install, and people who have had them put in are taking them out because they cost so much electricity to run. So I'm concerned that the most vulnerable will be left will be lumbered with an ineffective system. Jan, thank you. Let's go to Ash Mukherjee. Um, Ash, um, you have an unusual experience. You, you've actually spent some time in Antarctica seeing the impact of climate change. What's your view? I am very worried, Trevor, and thank you so much for that question. Uh, what worries me is that Antarctica is the one continent in the world that affects everybody else living everywhere. It keeps our feet dry and it gives us oxygen to breathe because of all the plankton that grows under the ice in Antarctica, which is halving at this point. And it feeds krill that feed uh, whales, which are fertilizers, giant fertilizers for the world's oceans. They feed Richard's freezers in every store in Iceland. And that Antarctic ice has already melted by half over the last 40 years. We can do the maths on how long that ice is going to last. OK, I should stay there for a second. Um, it's so tempting in a, in a sort of TV pun to come to you because he said I, Iceland here, Richard. But um, there is a serious point Please do. here. <laughs> is it too late? Have we gone too far to rescue the situation? Look, um, I, I think it's it's easy to um, uh, to be pessimistic, of course, because you you look at the destruction all around us um, uh, of the natural world that we we love, and and uh, it's seemingly a, a kind of daily occurrence now. Uh, these uh, one one in a hundred year events, these uh, biblical um, weather patterns that that were the the thing of legend before. So of course it is very serious. But I'm fueled by optimism, actually, and I'm fueled by hope because. Um, I, I see that most of all uh, citizens around the world are, are rising up, uh, declaring climate emergencies. We've got uh, kids striking from schools, uh, taking action into their own hands. We do have businesses trying to do better. And um, uh, the gentleman is absolutely right. Iceland is far from perfect. Iceland is not even a sustainable business, but we are to, trying to do what we can, where we can, and trying to do better. And I don't think there's really any business uh, men or women that, uh, uh, that don't want to try and uh, do better for the climate. Well, we've been talking about the role of government and report cards not that good, uh, but what action should we all be taking? That's next. I'd love to travel from London to Glasgow on a train. Well, it takes a day. To be honest, air travel is one of the worst ways we can contribute to climate change. We're going to have to bring down carbon emissions. We have to spend money. Twelve big corporations that are producing the overwhelming bulk of the world's plastics. I think we need to move away from single-use anything.
take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. If there is a bigger explosion, this area would be in the danger zone. These traffic jams snake for hours up and down this hillside. We know that 800,000 people have been displaced. Hong Kong is not China! I think experiencing the two million person march in Hong Kong, that was a moment. Police have been firing tear gas and rubber bullets. See fires all around us here. Siobhan Robbins, Sky News. Welcome back to The Great Debate, where we're discussing the climate crisis and asking, is it already too late? I want to go back to our wall, to our viewers' panel, and I'm going to talk to Nock Tran, uh, who is in Nottingham. Good evening, Nock. You've got a thought that you yeah. want to share with us. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I think I totally agree that we do need to worry about the climate change and because it is our planet, the, the only planet we've got. And if we don't look after it, we're going to die. We kill ourselves. Uh, and I think I'm grateful that we've got amazing scientists who actually have discovered all the changes that's happening. And also they are you know, offering all the options, all the things that we can do to make things better. And uh, many people are actually, many people clapping. That means they do agree that we do want to take actions. Is there a question you want to put yeah. to our studio guests? I do. I'd say that now is in crisis, but... Financial issues also a problem for all of us. Is it fair to pressure people to make like, very expensive changes in their lifestyles that they can't afford okay. just for the Thank sake of climate change? Thank you very much. Let's, let's bring that back into the studio and let's talk to our panel. Knox's question is, is it fair to pressure people into making expensive changes to their lifestyles? Mary Robinson... Is that what you and all of the others who are debating it in Glasgow, what you're going to make us do? I think it's a good question because the steps we want to take as individuals that are important have to be affordable. We have to have affordable electricity. We have to have affordable uh, ways of keeping our houses warm. We have to have affordable transport. This is really important. And I think governments have to think. Governments need to be in crisis mode and think, what do we need to do? They may have to spend some money in the shorter term. It's our children's money. And the reason I call it our children's money, it's the money for a safe future. So if we have to do things to make sure that going to clean energy is actually affordable, that just transition is paid for, that everything moves seamlessly pushing with incentives in the direction of clean energy, that we don't subsidise fossil fuel, that we stop all the bad things and move in the direction of the good things. If we have to spend more money to do it, I'd spend it. Chidi, um, 
Is there a danger here that, you know, everybody's on the side of good and virtue, but what they really want is for somebody else to do it? It's a great question. And it's about balancing out rights and responsibilities. Well, it's true, we all have a responsibility to act in a responsible way towards the, the climate. We can have you know, meat-free Mondays, we can have fossil fuel-free Fridays when we don't drive, but we need to have an overarching government system that supports us. If there's a system that, you know, where you have to live within a system where there's no public transport, you will have to use your car. If you live uh, in, a, in a district where recycling is impossible because there's no recycling depot, you won't be able to recycle. But all so of this is about balancing those But all of this is basically saying we don't have to do anything, it's all down to That's the man correct. in Whitehall. No, no, I disagree with you. I think that we have to do as much as we possibly can, but the governments create enabling environments. So to talk in a bit more detail about the question you were being asked just earlier on, I mentioned the Green Homes grant earlier on, and 62% of the public said they were going to take up this grant. They wanted to use it to effect a just transition and move their heating systems from gas-based ones to alternative renewable energy. But the government cut the grant, unannounced, in April, for no clear reason. Now, that, that's an irresponsible thing to do by the government, which right. causes people themselves to act relatively irresponsibly. There's, there's a chain of causality that we, we can't ignore. All right. Let's go back to Wall. Now, I want to talk to Jackie Skip. Jackie, how much of what has to be done is down to government, and how much is it down to... Voluntary effort by the average person in the street or on a bus. Um, yeah, I've, I find it really hard to be positive about the future sometimes. I look at my three young grandchildren and I wonder what sort of world any children they have will inherit. Um, it's an effort that has to come from all of us, really, to stand a chance of saving our world. I think we should put pressure where we can on businesses and governments. Um, I would love to see more incentives for green businesses and sanctions, sanctions for those that perform poorly. Um, but I think personal responsibility and setting an example to today's children is going to make a huge difference. I think it's too easy to think that as one person we can't affect any change. Alone we probably can't, but if millions of people just make one little change, we're going to see a massive difference. Thank you, um, Jack. To know what the panels. Thank you, Jackie. Elle, is that right? That we can all do something? I think so, absolutely. And um, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, recently report, uh, released this landmark report. And one of the most important statements in it, I think, is that every single tonne of greenhouse gases matters. Every single tenth of a degree matters. But also that means that every single action that we can all take matters, whether that's the individual, whether that's the business, whether that's the government. Everything that we can do makes a difference and like uh, the questioner has just said even though you might feel like as one solo person you can't make a huge difference there's a drop in an ocean an ocean's made up of many many drops so if we all get together and all make those changes and hope that you know you're getting support from government legislation you're getting support from international negotiations you're getting support from businesses if we all do our bit everything that we can do then we can affect change yeah, but is, um, not to be too cynical about this, but is that really how people behave? We tell them, everybody says, you know, you come on telly and I do programs like this, and we tell everybody, this is good for you, and everybody nods widely, and then they get back in their car. No, of course, you've got to create the enabling environment, as Judy was saying, to make those decisions easy, to make it easy to say, OK, instead of getting um, an, a flight to Scotland, I'm going to take the train. It has to be cheaper or easier or both. And it's about having a kind of a wholesale system change that means that those decisions are you know, the obvious decision to make rather than necessarily having to rely on people being, you know, good or moral because they feel like they should. Because whilst that might be an important part of people's decision making when it comes to the environment and protecting climate, it, it should be easy because everyone needs to make those decisions rather than just a few people who are already passionate about it. All right, we will return to this point. The stakes are very high. But even for us, but already for others, they're already too real. Up next, we'll be speaking to a government minister from the Maldives about the threat of climate change to the people of her country.
The climate crisis. Is it already too late? That's our topic on the great debate. And it's a question that's most pressing for island nations, some of which are already facing an existential threat. We're now joined from the Global Climate Conference in Glasgow by the Maldives Environment Minister, Aminath Shona. Good evening, Minister. Thank you for joining us. Um, what are you hoping for out of the next two weeks? First of all, thank you for having me. It's really great to be here. What are we looking for in this conference? We want the world to agree on 1.5 degrees. We would like all the countries to agree on climate finance, increasing climate finance, particularly for climate change adaptation, what we had agreed in Paris to release $100 billion a year at least. We are also looking for the countries to agree on loss and damage. These are critical issues that are very important for island countries like the Maldives. How far are we along on that $100 billion as far as you know? The Maldives is very vulnerable to climate change. We have seen, we know what's happening. Science is very clear on it. Since 2015, countries like the Maldives have received very little in terms of adaptation finance. The Maldives has received only one project for climate change adaptation. What we are talking about is the impact of climate change is real in the Maldives. Our coral reefs are dying, our beaches are eroding, we are losing our islands, we have run out of water. Countries like the Maldives need urgent finance for these adaptation needs, but we, we really haven't received the kind of finance that we require. We need urgently to address these things. The United Nations said last week that without some new steps, new measures, new targets, the uh, world is unlikely to hit that 1.5 degree target. And in fact, it looks more like 2.7 degrees. Tell us what 2.7 degrees would mean for the Maldives. We're currently at 1.1. And what we are seeing in the Maldives is things that we were told would happen towards the end of the century are happening now. Like I said, mo all the islands in the Maldives have run out of fresh water because so co coastal erosion has increased. Our islands are getting flooded more, heavy rainfall. When it doesn't rain, our, our islands run out of water. And these are real issues for us. Most of the islands in the Maldives are facing urgent issues that are related to extreme weather events. Our islands are about 1,200 islands. About 187 islands are inhabited. And around every island, we have a coral reef. And coral reefs are very sensitive to temperature increases. When our coral reefs die, we're talking about our survival and our food and our income are dependent on the vulnerabilities. So our fisheries industry, our tourism, basically we're talking about the Maldives becoming uninhabitable in the next couple of decades if we fail to agree on these targets right now. Minister, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Mary Robinson, you heard that and you hear that again and again. How typical is this of the uh, partners at uh, Glasgow? It's very typical of the climate vulnerable forum countries. They face an existential threat. Uh, that's about climate justice. Uh, the elders that I have the honour to chair feel very strongly in support of the continuing sovereignty of each of the Pacific Islands and the Caribbean Islands and other island states. We are very supportive of the measures that the Climate Vulnerable Forum want to see at the COP. And these measures include a climate emergency pact. You know, you talked about the 100 billion. Uh, we are not miss we're not meeting it in 2020 or 2021 or 2022, apparently. It won't be until 2023 that we'll fully meet. But it's a six-year um, promise um, so it's $600 billion, and in the years 23, 24, and 25, we've got to make more. And that's doable, absolutely, by the rich world. Um, so it's a $600 billion. It needs far more for adaptation, as has been said by Minister Shona. Uh, it's absolutely clear 
that we need to listen to the existential voices and get that urgency and then have Boris Johnson and all the other ministers have that crisis sense, I mean okay. crisis sense, of how to move forward. Thank you. Let's go back to our viewers' panel. And I want to... Um, a lot of support there for that uh, comment. Uh, I want to hear from David Young now. Uh, David, oh, yeah. I, I think Thanks you so have much. a view on this. I have a, a really big view. I'm, I have two boys who are about 20 years old, and so obviously I've got a major impact. Um, now, obviously, my question may be a little rhetorical, but it's a very serious point. I really feel that since the Industrial Revolution, we've got a lot of things we've done wrong, perhaps, but we are a really great big influence in this world because of that. And I think we, you know, we can manufacture a positive solution here. We've got Commonwealth countries. We can be part of a green climate change re revolution. So my point is, my question, as a major pollution contributor since the Industrial Revolution, do we have a bigger responsibility for climate change because of our industrial past? Thank you very much, David. David's question is, do we have a bigger responsibility for climate change because of our industrial past? Richard Walker. Uh, yeah, I think we do. Um, and I think some of the, uh, some of the discussions that, that are going on now where, where um, you know, d developing nations, uh, countries particularly at risk, um, who haven't necessarily had the luxury of hundreds of years of uh, industrialised production um, should absolutely be, um, be helped uh, by the richer world. And that may mean higher taxes for business. But, you know, ultimately, I think it's the right thing to do. And I should also just, I want to refer back um, to one of the questions before the break, um, which was uh, basically on, on this issue of... Um, uh, democratising environmentalism. We have to make it relevant and relatable uh, to real people, people like my customers who might only have 25 quid a week to spend on food. We can't be in an echo chamber here and be preaching. And I think that goes for whether we're trying to um, help developing nations around the world or indeed people in the UK um, who are on a very tight budget. Um, we, we must um, make this democratised. Uh, we have to change the subsidy systems so that um, uh, anyone can afford to be an environmentalist. Do you think cost. other business leaders are in the same place as you are? Um, not necessarily, but, uh, but, uh, but I do think that uh, shift is happening and changing. And the, even better if the government can enforce it quicker. Uh, I think it's the right thing to do. Um, and I think we need to um, bear responsibility uh, for the plastic that we're putting into the environment and some of our supply chain choices so that we can uh, start to make the, the right decisions as a business community. And yes, potentially, that might mean higher taxes. But uh, I think considering the, um, the nature of the emergency, it's, uh, it's only right. OK, thank you, Richard. Let's come back to um, the... Well, I want to talk to Harry Hayfield. Um, Harry, you've been listening. What do you make of what you've heard? Well, I, I have been listening, Trevor, and you're absolutely correct. Uh, the minister from the Maldives has hit the nail on the head because she's experiencing it. I mean, it is not that long ago that the island nation of Vanavutu uh, in the Pacific was actually put on warning that they could be had to be evacuated at any time. And as we've heard from the Managing Director of Iceland, virtue is being talked about. So I have a particular problem, and that is, what is the point of this conference when we, as ordinary people, are being told to reduce our carbon emissions to zero, and countries such as Australia and China are saying, yes, we will indeed reduce them, but only to 50% of 1990 emissions, and not until 2050 or even 2060 or even later. Thank you very much, Harry. Well, uh, Ella, what is the point? Well, the point is to make ambitious targets and, importantly, to meet those targets because, you know, it's all very well and good making pledges, but we have to actually make sure that those pledges are met because, ultimately, I mean, current uh, pledges are consistent with warming of around 2.7 or perhaps more um, degrees of, of warming and... As we've heard, it's just not good enough because we absolutely must limit warming to not just well below two degrees, but one and a half at most, because we're seeing 
devastating impacts already. You have to just look at the news headlines to see that. We have to do absolutely everything that we can, and that is, you know, from business, it's from these kinds of conferences, it's from world leaders, but it's also from all of us. OK. Um, Mary Robinson, let me put this to you. There's this enormous jamboree in Glasgow, costs somebody a lot of money. Um, that some, the Indian Prime Minister stands up today and says, we're going to do you a favour. We're going to get to net zero by 2070, which is 20 years after the UK, and by most people's uh, reckoning, way too late to make the impact that is necess necessary. Um, to quote a young sage, are we getting two weeks of blah, blah, blah without much impact on the situation? <clears throat> First of all, if I may, Trevor, I want to actually say I'm encouraged by each of the questioners this evening because they realize we're in a crisis and that we have to take it seriously. But I want to answer your question about India. I have praised India today for that target of meeting um, a goal of net zero by 2070. India had to think very deeply about the goal. India's carbon footprint individually is much, much lower than the rest of the world. It has come late. It is a, a very large, poor, developing country, and it has to meet its ambitions. And I am praising India for making that commitment because I think it's real for India, and it's real that it's going renewable energy as much as possible in difficult circumstances, etc. So let's not, let's not equate um, what India does, and indeed what China does in committing to 2060, with what the rich world which has benefited so much from fossil fuel, needs to do more of, and can do more of, and should do more of. You know, th that's really the balance that we have, common but differentiated responsibility. Well, what is the best way to persuade people to change their behaviour? We're going to be talking about that next. Change is not going to come from inside there. That is not leadership. This is leadership. This is what leadership is it's a horrible thing to be doing, to be honest. We don't want to be here. It's, uh, it's central because it's one of the measures uh, all governments can put in place to value carbon, this essential element in both problem and solution in climate change. If we track and measure and value carbon, put a price on carbon, which we can do a number of different ways with regulation or taxation or a market mechanism. If we do those things and we do them across the whole of our economy, we incentivize all of the actions that we need to take in order to deal with a problem. And we put a price, a penalty on all the actions that we no longer want to take, which are causing risk to, to us and the planet. So we've got to get it right. The idea behind Article 6 is that you encourage individual countries to put their own price on carbon, to choose their own method of valuing carbon, but you also encourage other countries to cooperate, to build larger marketplaces, to create more liquidity, more investment, a greater range of incentives, put together a greater response to climate change. And we need rules to do that, to do it properly. There's no value in doing something that's illusory it actually has to do something to solve the problem. So we have to have rules for that. We have to agree those rules and we have to agree them amongst many parties in order to have the largest effect. The arguments are very well rehearsed. They've been around for a very long time. I and mean, we had a, an earlier version of this in Article 12 of the Kyoto Protocol, which created the clean development mechanism, which, which worked, which moved a lot of money from the developed world to the developing world, so-called. A lot of money moved to China, for example, and which has no doubt led to them creating their own uh, carbon market, which has launched this year. That was in large part a success, although actually we didn't design the marketplace well enough to cope with the financial crisis and oversupply. So people know about this phenomenon. They understand what it can do, but they're obviously naturally nervous that the market does actually deliver environmental benefits. Also, one of the reasons why this agreement is so hard to get is that there are countries like Brazil who benefited from the previous system, who believe that they might not do so well from a new version. They want the credits from the past system to count. 
And they want to be sure that they get as much as possible out of this new marketplace. And so they negotiate hard on that front. And they will need to move in the next few days in order to get overall agreement to Article 6. Welcome back. Is it already too late to tackle the climate crisis? That's a topic for tonight's great debate. And if it isn't too late, what's the best way to get people to change? I'm going to talk to Isha Gill. Uh, Isha, what's your question for our panel tonight? Hi, so my question is, will Extinction Rebellion's tactics influence government policy and create meaningful change? Have you got a particular reason for asking that, Isha? Uh, yeah, actually. I um, study government and politics at school, and recently we've been looking into pressure groups. Um, and actually, I think uh, Extinction Rebellion in particular, they raise many issues and they have a wide support in the public sphere. And they definitely have um, raised issues that need to be raised. And the media certainly do give them a lot of attention. But, you know, the government haven't really been interested in working with them. And I think for real change to happen, uh, there has to be change in government policy and to get big corporations that actually produce a lot of the carbon footprint. We, we need to force them to change because actually they're not really going to do it on their own. OK, thank you, Isha. Now, Isha's question then, uh, panel, is will Extinction Rebellion's tactics influence government policy and create meaningful change? Let, let me start with you, Richard. Is Extinction Rebellion part of what has taken you to the uh, place that you are right now on this set of issues? Well, I think they've certainly got noticed and they've uh, been a big part of the, the, the narrative. Um, the media has certainly given them a lot of attention. And, of course, they're raising uh, some very serious issues. Um, my concern is that to win hearts and minds uh, and ultimately um, the, the will of the public is that we have to tell people without telling them off. And we need to reframe environmentalism to talk not about cost and compromise, but about jobs and opportunity, because I think that's what really matters to real people on a budget. I think XR have done a, a great job in terms of raising the issues. However, some of the uh, splinter groups, such as Insulate Britain, um, in my mind, have, have caused nothing but annoyance and uh, turned people off. And the problem is... Um, if, if you uh, cajole um, and harangue people too much, they will simply shrug their shoulders and look the other way. Uh, so so it's, a, it's about jobs, opportunity, not cost and compromise. Um, and I think it, that's the, the tightrope and the fine balance that we need to find. OK, let's see if we can get a, a sense of what our 100 viewers think. Let's go to the wall. And I'm going to ask you, without getting too much into the detail of this splinter group or that splinter group or whatever it is, the direct action groups which operate under the banner of Extinction Rebellion. Do you think that they have played a role in changing the government's view in the right direction? Hands up who thinks that they have played a role in moving government in the right direction? I think uh, it's looking to me... Actually, not a majority, but not zilch. And there's a few people who are shaking their heads um, and rather negatively about it. 
Ken, Ken Isaacs, um, I can see you there shaking your head. Um, why, why do you think that they haven't played a positive role? Um, well, um, well, Trevor, I, I think really that the government uh, have acted on their own anyway. Um, the manner of protest we've seen can be counterproductive, as Richard Walker said. Um, I mean, I'd like to ask Chiddy how he'd feel if he was trying to get to hospital, for example, for a family emergency, his path was blocked by protesters, and then the family member sadly died. Why do protesters not just peacefully protest where they aren't going to affect innocent people? Chidi, explain. I can only apologise um, for inconveniences and challenges that protests, democratic protests, create. To answer the question directly, in May of 2019, the UK government declared a climate change emergency. And there's no doubt in my mind that that wouldn't have happened. That early day opposition motion in Parliament passed primarily because of Extinction Rebellion. I know lots of Extinction Rebellion people, all of whom, you know, vicars, teachers, ordinary people like you and I, who want to see the world be a better place and the UK lead the effort in changing the world. Now, what the government does is the government's own responsibility. But our responsibility has always been to, to state very clearly the kinds of risks that international agencies around the world are talking about, but our media in the UK are not. I'll give you a perfect example. The IPCC report that came out, the AR6 WG1 report that came out on the 6th of April, August of this year, led to absolutely no falls in the prices or in the share price of Shell, led to no fall in the price of oil. And that was because everyone felt that despite the fact that these powerful reports are coming out, governments would not act. And what Extinction Rebellion, like many other groups, have done is go on to continue to show the public what is actually happening. OK. Ken, are you persuaded that, on balance, what XR have done ha has been a plus rather than a minus? Um, yes, it has been a plus, but the way they've gone about it is a minus. I mean, Chitty there is... is totally not answered the thrust of the question. Why not peacefully protest instead of uh, you getting splinter groups, blocking motorways, um, you know, putting people at risk? You, you know, answer the question. I'd gladly answer the question. Really? Again, if, you, if you'd like me to... I, I can't take responsibility for... Absolutely. No, nobody's asking it because you haven't been climbing on. You haven't been climbing on people's offices and so on. But there is a specific question here: Have these tactics made the job of persuading people to do what you want them to do easier or harder? In the last six months, Extinction Rebellion membership has grown. No, the that's not the question. Though. Have gone up. Has it made the job easier or harder? It's straightforward. And, and, and I think that's because people are more persuaded. I think that because we have actually gone out and made the case that isn't made anywhere else in the press, that there are members of the government who are interested, there are members of the public who are persuaded. We just don't have a government that's been able to follow right. through. OK, let me come to you, Mary Robinson. Um, I'm not going to ask you to answer for tactics which are specific, perhaps, to the UK. But the direct action uh, tactics and so mm. on, do you get the sense that this is what is pushing governments in the direction of paying attention? Or are they marginal or are they negative? I think the protests that we're seeing, the young climate activists, yes, Extinction Rebellion and others have definitely moved the needle of what governments think. There's no doubt about it. They are more persuaded because of the urgency, the direct voice. I actually have a different way of asking the way in which individuals can make a difference. And that's three steps that I call on. One is to make the climate crisis personal in your own life. And you know you've done that if you're doing something today you weren't doing yesterday. Doing something maybe more rigorously, recycling, um, slow fashion, changing your diet, changing the way you move around, whatever. Then you own the issue, and it's actually good for your mental health probably at this stage. Secondly, get angry, and I mean angry, with those who aren't taking their responsibility. And that's what Extinction Rebellion and all the others are, are, are you know, doing very explicitly, if you like. But the third thing we don't do enough of, Trevor, we don't do enough of this. We don't imagine this world that we need to be hurrying towards. It's going to be a much healthier world because it won't have the fumes of fossil fuel. Um, indoor and outdoor that kill about eight or nine million people each year. Mary Robinson, thank you. Let me 
As we come to the end here, come back to our viewers' panel. Tonight, the Queen has called on world leaders to achieve true statesmanship. True statesmanship. So let's have a show of hands from viewers on the question that we've been asking tonight. Is it too late? Those who think it is, please show your, throw your hands. A very, uh, about a third, quarter of a third of you, and those who still are optimistic to think we can turn this around. Yeah, that's definitely a majority, and that is an optimistic end. It's all that we have time for this evening. Uh, though the arguments obviously are not going to end there. It just remains for me to say thanks to our panellists here in the studio, Dr Ella Gilbert, Chidi Oti Obihara, and from Glasgow, Mary Robinson, and also Richard Walker. And I want to say thank you to all our viewers, our panel, who've been as robust and boisterous as ever, and thank you, waving goodbye. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you at home for watching the great debate.